no memory of my mom's cooking. She passed when I was 10 years old. Brain tumor. She couldn't use her right arm or her left leg. Was in a wheelchair for years before she passed. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I don't really remember her at home. We wanted to see her. We see her in a hospital or a long-term care facility. No memory of her cooking. Dad was an entrepreneur. Ran his own business. That meant some long days at work and some even longer nights in the home office. And, you know, he busted his butt to put food on the table for all of us. But the thing was, he wasn't necessarily the one putting the food on the table. Because my brother and sister and I, we were latchkey kids, literally with the string around the neck and the key. And we would open that door and there would always, every single day, be a note. Chores, things we had to do before dad got home to make sure dinner was put on the table. My older brother, he was in charge of some kind of meat, usually. My younger sister canned vegetables, frozen vegetables. She was younger, that was easy. Me, I was the carbs. I'm still the carbs. It has become my life's work to be the carbs. But more often than not, it was one very particular kind of carbs that I was in charge of. Instant mashed potatoes. Not sure if you've ever had the pleasure. Dehydrated potatoes put through a pencil sharpener, it seemed like. Water, milk, butter, salt. Not necessarily the best thing on the menu, but I have to tell you, I love them. I love them not for the flavor. I love them because they were my job. They were my contribution. I loved as a kid, when I got to the point, I didn't even need to measure anymore. I could eyeball that thing and make it perfectly. I remember us going to family therapy, going through that time. First session, therapist goes around the room and says, please say your name and what you think your role is in the household. I said, I'm Ian. I'm the mashed potatoes. And it was so part of my identity. And look, my brother, older brother, younger sister, we fought like cats and dogs in that kitchen. We fought like cats and dogs all the time. But when dad came home and the food went on the table, well, we may not have been a family that said grace, but we damn well gave thanks. We gave thanks for the food on the table. We gave thanks for the father that was getting us through. We gave thanks for each other. And we gave that thanks in spite of the empty chair at the end of that table. That sense of gratitude that we felt, we got it, we gave it, we wanted more. It created a cycle. It became like an engine for our healing. It fed our lives. It fed our bodies. It fed our souls. And so it's no wonder that my brother and sister and I all still love to cook. It's a passion for every single one of us. And we still fight like siblings do, except now we tend to fight over who's bringing what to the family functions. But as happened with, uh, with Christmas, with Thanksgiving this past year, inevitably we'll get a group email and it will say somewhere in the middle, Ian, you going to bring mashed potatoes? <laughs> Hell yeah, I will. <laughs> Except the game has changed, friends. It's now russet potatoes, skins on, cut up, cooked in milk, roasted garlic, white cheddar, chives, kosher salt, black pepper. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So good. But the thing is, friends, the thing that I think about most when I reflect on that time is my dad and how he must have felt. You remember being a kid and maybe it was Christmas or a birthday or Mother's Day, Father's Day. You didn't have any money to buy your parents something. So what did you do? You made something for them. Usually in class, probably a piece of crap. But when you brought it home, you said, I made this for you. And as someone who now has grown kids, I miss those days when my two kids would come home and go, Dad, I made this for you. Ooh, gets you right in the feels. And we got to say, I made this for you every day to Dad. And what that also makes me think about is, why don't we, all of us, as individuals, do the kinds of things that allow us to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I made this for you. Because we don't. 
we don't often respect ourselves in that way. We're not grateful for ourselves in that way. I'm not, I'm not saying that I stand in front of my bathroom mirror with a plate of food going, I made this for you. <laughs> okay, maybe twice. <laughs> but we need to do that thing. Whatever that is for me, yeah, it's cooking. It's an act of self-care for me when I am home by myself cooking. I live alone. I love having people around my table. When my girlfriend is over, I love it. When I have friends over, I love it. You're all welcome. It's fine. I love having people over, but more often than not, I'm cooking for me. And I take pictures of every meal I cook, and I'll post that on Instagram. I don't care. But sometimes when I do, I'll get a note from somebody after I've posted this picture. A friend of mine will say, hey, who's over? Nobody. Well, why did you plate it like that with all the garnish and the lovely stuff on top? And I say, because I'm worth it. And so are you. But we don't do that for ourselves. And maybe... Maybe the reason sometimes we don't do that for ourselves is we look at ourselves and we think those cupboards are bare. We think that maybe we're not working with a lot of ingredients. We just have leftovers, leftovers of whatever our life was before. Well, when it's just leftovers in the fridge, I got to tell you, that's when I get excited. Those beautiful mashed potatoes I make, they don't taste as good the second day. No matter how much you warm them up, microwave it, it's not the same thing. So what I do is take those mashed potatoes, maybe add a little bit of egg, a little bit of flour, some extra spices, roll it out, make myself some gnocchi instead. Or maybe I'll add a little bit less, or a little bit more egg, a little bit less flour, do a nice savory mashed potato waffle. Maybe I'll make mashed potato tortillas. You take that thing and you repurpose it. You make something else. Whatever you got left, whether it's in your actual cupboards or whatever you've got left from what the past has done to you, and you make something new. You live a repurposed life. Talking to my dad as an adult about that time, he says, and this speaks to me so much, he said, look, I, I took what we had and I did the best I could. Because our family was never going to be the same family it was before. So we had to make something new. And I'd like to think maybe something better eventually. The strength that we all found from it. But yeah, it was a struggle. A struggle getting through that time, especially being a kid. Psychologically, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to interact, especially with my friends. I was the only kid I knew in my class at my school that didn't have a parent that way. I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know how to interact. I didn't, I didn't want to answer those questions. And so I did something that maybe a lot of people do when they're going through a trauma in that age. I had imaginary friends. Mine were Jenny and Bennett. I have no idea where those names came from. Those are some fancy names for a couple of, you know, 10-year-old imaginary friends. Jenny and Bennett. But I would go outside and play with them forever because when I was with Jenny and Bennett, I didn't have to answer the questions. I didn't have to hear, what's it like not having a mom? I didn't, what's it like that you're home now? I, I didn't have to answer those questions. My dad was probably looking at me playing outside going, who the hell is Ian talking to? Because I'd be out there forever. But the interesting thing about Janie and Bennett is when they most often paid a visit was when we were about to sit down to lunch or to dinner. We'd be sitting down at the table, and I would literally go, Do you hear that? Somebody's knocking at the door. And I'd go over to the door and go, Janie, Bennett, you're here. Stay for dinner? Sure. My brother's rolling his eyes at me. My sister was eight. She was probably freaked out, thought I was inviting ghosts over or something. Ian's talking to ghosts. And I'd have this whole conversation with him at the door, and by the, time we, by the time we came around the corner, there was my dad setting two empty places at the table. Talk about great fuel. He acknowledged my pain. He wanted to help see me through. He wanted to take what we had, repurpose it, and make something else, live that repurposed life. Whatever you have in the cupboards, make something new. Find that great fuel. Find the thing that is going to feed your life and fuel that engine.